Today I'm talking to Greg McKenzie. You've been in mountain biking for a long time, so tell us a little bit about your history with mountain biking and suspensions. Sure. Um, so I, I started riding mountain bikes. This is a very loose term, mountain bikes, but I started riding when I was about 13 or 14. I got my first bike from my dad and just went out and, you know, r- rode some real basic trails, but that was a long time ago. Um, and then I started to kind of get into it more once I graduated from high school because I had a real job and I had time and money and uh, bought my first real, real mountain bike back in 94. And that same year, got my first job at a bike shop, uh, Tie Cycles, downtown Seattle. And that was actually the first year that I started thinking about suspension um, and then also working on suspension, but very limited. I mean, you know, it's 94. We didn't really have the internet as we know it. And so anything that you wanted to know, you had to either call somebody or you had to have them fax you the manual or have them send it, you know, via mail. And so back then we had the Mag 21 from RockShox and there wasn't a lot to it. It's a very simple fork. Um, I do remember the first hop up we did was you could get a long travel kit which increased the travel by, I think, half an inch. Um, and the irony was all it really did was there was a top-out spacer that you just made shorter, so then the fork got longer. It was already a noodle of a fork, and then you made it more noodly, but you had long travel. So that was pretty exciting. Um, but that was, you know, that was just something you did in a bike shop. It wasn't like I was really full-time into it uh, until about five years ago is when I just decided to kind of make the switch. I mean, I've been a mechanic for 25 years and it's been a a good ride, but at a certain point you just, you want to be an adult. (laughs) And so, so it's really hard to stay in the bike industry and be an adult as a mechanic, but suspension kind of allowed me to market myself, create a niche and actually make a a decent living. Um, And I get to have a job that I really like and I get to control. So if I remember right, there's some story, some relationship with you and RockShock in the past too. Is that right? Uh, I used to, I actually started Butter uh, because I was working for a distributor called uh, Seattle Bike Supply. They're down in Kent. They, they don't exist anymore, but um, they were a RockShox distributor. And at that point in time, for you to be a RockShox distributor, you had to also be a service center. And when I started there, I was just doing warranty stuff for some of the other brands that were in the same umbrella. In that respect, I was uh, a RockShox service tech. Um, and it was kind of slick because, you know, I had access to tools and training that you can only get if you're a distributor. And it was kind of nice to just focus on one brand. Like all I did was RockShox. That was it. Um, shops from around the country would send me stuff. And A rough estimate. How many forks and shocks do you think you've serviced over the years? The real numbers that I can remember or because i've been keeping track since i started butter but i started off i think the first year i did 250 jobs if you will so each job is like a fork or a shock Mm -hmm. the next year it was like 400 and then it's been consistently over 600 a year now um at a certain point i can only do so much i mean you know one person you only have so many hours but i think consistently now i'm at about six to seven hundred jobs a year um so that's a lot so tell us a little bit more about Butter. What is it? What do you do? And how do we connect with you? Uh, so the best way to connect is probably through my website. Uh, the website's got, you know, phone number and it's got basic pricing and, and what goes into a job. Um, but you can submit uh, a request through the website. You can also call me. Uh, my phone number is on there. Um, I do have a, uh, I work with two bike shops locally as drop-off spots. Those shops are on the website as well. Um, but you always want to get in touch with me before you drop stuff off. It, it's, it, it almost never happens, but every once in a while somebody will just drop something off and not tell me. And <laughs> nothing's going to happen if you don't tell me. But yeah, just go through the website, send me an email. It's pretty straightforward. What brands of suspension do you service these days? Uh, the, the big ones are going to be RockShox and Fox. Um, that's probably 98% of my business, just because that's the, the majority of the OEM spec on bikes. Um, I do some Manitou, some Marzocchi, uh, a little bit of DVO, uh, MRP. Basically, if I can get my hands on tools and parts, I'll do it. Um, There are a couple brands that 
you know, they're, they're very particular about who they set up as service centers and, and that's fine. Um, like Cane Creek, uh, I've been trying to get set up with them for a while, but I think they're just also so busy. They don't have time to set up new service centers. This is all about new mountain biker and somebody's just getting into the sport and there's, there's short travel, mid travel, long travel bikes. And you know, they range anywhere from, I mean, we were talking a minute ago about long travel fork. I mean, I have a bike on the wall over here. It's, it's a long travel bike from the day to 80 millimeters of travel, which would be like yeah, yeah. extra short by today's standards. Yeah. So when somebody's trying to figure out how much travel to they need in a bike, what do you advise them? So this is always kind of a tricky question because it's, it's multifaceted. Like it's not just, I am going biking and I need this much travel. You could technically do a ton of trails on a fully rigid bike, but we all know that that's hard on the body. It's not really fun. And really suspension comes down to control. So you're looking for traction and control. Um, you kind of have to choose the uh, level of suspension that will match the trails that you're comfortable riding. Um, but that being said, I think if you always kind of err on the side of too much travel, I think that's technically a better answer. Um, it, there's something to be said for you can maybe get yourself in more trouble with more travel. I, I certainly experienced that over the years. You know, you start off with a hardtail, fully rigid, and you can only really go so fast. And then you put a suspension fork on and you're like, oh, holy smokes, look what I can do. And then you crash because you got to go faster. And then you learn. And then you get a dual suspension bike and you do it all over again. But I think if you're kind of in the 120 to 140 range for absolute beginners, it, it gives you a good amount of travel without, you know, having too much extra, if you will. Because um, you also see guys that are like, oh, my buddy had a downhill bike, so he gave it to me and I just took it out to the trails and, and yeah, you can pedal around on a downhill bike, but everything about that bike is designed to go down. Like you, you can't climb on it. It sucks to pedal. Um, but it is rideable. It's to me, a downhill bike on regular trails is as rideable as a fully rigid bike. You can do it, but it's really not the purpose of that bike. Um, and I think also people need to spend enough time riding enough trails to start to understand, you know, the blue, the black, the double black, what, what that all means and what it means to them because not everybody agrees on what is a hard trail. I think the 120 to 140 range is, is really kind of a, a sweet spot because, um, I mean, there's kids up on Whistler that are 13 years old doing backflips on trails on hardtails. I mean, those kids are ninjas and they were born at Whistler, so good for them. But having something that allows you to be comfortable and gives you good traction. I think, you know, that's a, that's a good starting point. If somebody came and said, you know, I just want the softest ride possible. What would your response be? I guess I would ask why they think soft is better. You know, are they looking for comfort? Are they looking for traction? Are they just, they just want to experience the word plush? You know, I, I would really need to know what, what it is they are expecting out of that soft off suspension. Um, uh, I think setup is, is so important. Like you can have the most expensive bike, the best stuff in the world. And if it's not set up right, it, it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, you, you take quote unquote, the, a soft plush Fox 40 full on downhill fork. If you pump it up so high that it doesn't move. Now you have technically a very heavy sh short travel bike that doesn't really do what it's supposed to do. Um, and then, the other end of the spectrum is if you have a bike that's appropriate for what you're riding, but you have half as much air pressure in the suspension as you should have, you're going to bottom out all the time. Um, eventually, if you're running it at way too low of a pressure or way too soft, you're going to start to damage things. Um, and plus, you're not getting you know out of the bike what you should. I mean, if you have a 150 travel bike and you sag 50% into the travel, you're you're missing out. So if I'm hearing it correctly, you know, going for strictly a plush ride. Um, may not be beneficial because the bike might not handle very well if you do that. Yeah. Um, and yeah. you may actually end up not using the suspension the way that it's intended to be designed, intended to be used. Sure. Yeah. How about this? Uh, I've got some kids and, you know, actually I've got my, I've got my son's bike up here um, yeah. in the stand. If somebody says, hey, you know, do kids need suspension? And, and if so, how much? What would you say? Uh, I, I think it's, 
it's kind of the, the same thing as the question of how much suspension do you need? It, it really is based on, is it appropriate for the riding they're doing? Um, it, I think that the hardest part is as soon as you add suspension to anything, you're adding weight. Uh, and there are a lot of kids bikes out there. I mean, my kids are 40 pounds. If they had to ride a 40 pound bike, they couldn't pick the thing up if they crashed. I mean, it, that would be me riding a 230 pound bike. Like that's a motorcycle. And without the motor, that thing's no fun, you know? Um, so I think it, again, it's, it's depending on the trail that you're taking them on. Um, I mean, there's a local kid who's doing 24 foot doubles and he's seven years old and he definitely, definitely needs suspension the way that he's going, you know, but then you have little munchkins that just want to cruise down a little dirt path with mom and dad. They're not going to boost anything. They're not jumping. Um, I think in, in that, in that realm, like fat tires are a pretty good kind of starting point. Um, but once you start actually getting on trails, you know, and you're actually hitting roots and rocks, uh, you know, suspension really is, it's, it's always going to be a benefit as far as control. I, th I think the hardest part of suspension for kids is that most forks are designed for adults. Mm -hmm. So valving is designed for adults. Air pressures are designed for adults. Um, and so you really, um, sometimes it's a struggle to get uh, an adult suspension bike to work for a kid who just doesn't weigh enough to, to get the thing to work properly. Yeah, the other challenge I've seen too, especially on smaller kids' bikes that have suspension forks is the springs that come in them are so stiff, the kid's never going to move them. They're, it's basically yeah. a rigid fork to begin. I mean, that's always going to be a rigid fork for them. So I think if a yeah. parent is looking at a suspension bike, they got to figure out, can a kid actually influence suspension? Will they actually compress it or not? Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, like on my son's bike behind me, like that is an adult fork, but it's also, it's an air fork. So I could actually yeah. adjust the pressure and kind of dial it in a little bit for his weight. Um, it yeah. came with another suspension fork on it. that was just way too stiff for his weight, even though it was designed for <laughs> the kid's bike. He can't get the full travel out of it. Um, it's just not going to, um, but it's yeah. a, a better ride over the roots and bumps and all that stuff, a little bit better traction in the front, which is good for him because otherwise sometimes he does kind of nail into things. Another thing too, uh, last year, a buddy of mine was looking at buying a bike and I was, we're talking about buying new, new versus used. And, mm -hmm. you know, he, he kind of big with tech gadgets and all that sort of stuff. And like, you know, take like TVs and everything else. Like uh, oftentimes, you know, uh, this year's mid range is as good as last year's top end when it comes to a lot of electronics and things like that. Sure, sure. But when it comes to suspensions, is that true? D does it work like that? Not, it, yes and no, not, not necessarily. Um, most, most of these companies are on like three to four year product development cycles. And so it, sometimes it'll take, you know, three or four years for stuff to become normal, if you will. Like it was, you know, the hot thing, six months ago, it's still going to be there for a few years. Um, unless they totally mess something up and, and they have to do a recall, which is very rare. You know, they, it doesn't make financial sense for them to update, update, update every six months. Um, especially because this stuff is all, it's, it's, you know, physical hardware. It's not like a, a computer that you can just, you know, update. Um, also, the thing you run into is at different price points, you just can't, apply fancy technology and materials by making them cheaper. Like there are just certain things that cost a certain amount of money, like a really cheap fork, you know, like a $200 fork will have a steel steer tube. It'll have steer, uh, steel upper legs because steel is heavier and it's cheaper to, ma uh, to manufacture. And then you'll have a coil spring cause that's cheaper than doing an air spring. And so you can't just, add in value by making it cheaper, if you will. It just costs money to make fancy stuff. Um, the other thing you kind of run into is everybody loves the fancy stuff, all the bells and whistles, but <laughs> to be perfectly honest, the majority of people do not need the full on thousand dollar fork. They just don't. Um, I'm not saying don't buy it. I mean, I have fancy stuff. It's great. It's fun to tinker with, but most people aren't going to push that thing anywhere near what the pros do, you know, and they have full factory support so they can literally get the most out of it. The other thing too, is that the, this stuff happens so fast. I mean, three years seems like a long time, but you know, that once that cycle's done, everybody is done with that wheel size, that, uh, you know, that drivetrain 
component group, you know? And so that stuff, it gets pretty cheap to get really good performance if you wait a few years, but then you run the risk of being so outdated that you have no resale value. So it's, you know, there's always that game. You, you can play that game in the bike industry every six months and you'll never win. You just won't win. So. So let me put it to you another way. I've got a, a 2015 RockShox Pike and compared to a 2021 RockShox Pike, yeah. how much am I missing? Uh, it's, it's kind of funny the the biggest thing that I think you're going to miss is the updates in like the air spring. Um, I mean, cause I had a, I had a 15 pike and then I put in, I think it was like 17. I put in the debonair upgrade and it was a $42 upgrade. I literally couldn't believe that it did everything they said it did. It, it completely transformed the fork. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I would still be happy riding that fork. There's nothing wrong with that fork other than now I have a bigger fork. The pike is big enough for me, but I think a, a Lyric is more appropriate for my size um, or a 36 or, or what have you. Um, but the newest pike, you don't have to upgrade anything because they've taken what they've learned from their little adjustments and just put it into the new one. And then of course, every year, a little bit lighter, a little bit stiffer, blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean... It, it, they they can't make leaps and bounds every year. They just can't. You know, all they can do is learn from what they did in the previous generation. That's one of the things actually I really appreciate about RockShock is a lot of times if you have an older fork, they might release a newer version of something, but you can buy the, the different part and put it mm -hmm. in the older one. You know, yeah. forty two bucks or whatever, and yeah. you have effectively a newer fork. So you talked a little bit about maintaining a fork and keeping yep. running. You know, manufacturers release a schedule and say every, you know, 200 hours or 50 hours maybe for a minor service and a 200 hours for a major service. Yep. Like, how rigid, I mean, do we really need to follow that? Like, I saw a post from somebody the other day and they're like, oh, it doesn't move anymore. I guess it needs a service. I feel like that's, that's a little too long. Yes. Uh, but but yeah. those schedules, I mean, are those schedules like just to make more money or are those schedules really what the forks need? So I think it, at the end of the day, everything is about money, of course, but they have to kind of pick a time because they have to uh, apply parameters to like the whole country, the whole world, different, uh, you know, terrain, different weather. I think they kind of play it a little aggressive to make sure that if you stay on these hourly service intervals, you're going to get the best performance out of your fork. Um, that being said, I mean, it's amazing what people will send me that's like seven years old, never been touched, technically still works. Almost everybody says, I think it worked fine or it feels fine. And then I get the thing open and all the nitrogen's gone. The oil is brown because it used to, you know, it used to be red and now it's burned and dirty. Their, sh their shims are burned. Uh, you know, their seals are just full of dirt. But these things do put up with a, a lot of hell. Um, but then I also get a bunch of people who all rebuild their fork and they're just blown away. They're like, what did you do? And, and literally all I did was follow the directions, put in the new stuff, clean it up. I mean, there's, there's, you know, obviously there's, there's some technical knowledge there, but if you, if you just stay on top of the service intervals, this stuff, it lasts longer. Um, it works better. And then also it's kind of like when you get your bike in for a tune up, back when I used to do bicycle tune-ups, which I don't really do anymore, but you would always clean the bike first to look for problems. So that way you wouldn't do a full overhaul on a bike and then find that the frame is cracked. You know, you always, like I never start rebuilding anything until I've completely torn it apart because if I get in and, and X, Y, and Z are broken and the whole thing's cooked, then there's no reason to put seals into a broken fork. So um, it, it's also interesting too, because like Fox's interval for a full rebuild is 125 hours. And RockShox is 200 hours. I, I don't think that a RockShox fork is 75 more hours more durable. I think they just kind of have, you know, that's their arbitrary number, which is based on, I'm sure, a lot of testing that they've done. Um, but you can, you can fudge on these numbers a little bit, you know. Like if, if it's 51 hours, it's not like your leg seals are just going to stop working, you know. Um, but I will say RockShox has kind of made it a policy that if you ignore the 50 hour service, they get to basically say, we're not going to warranty your fork or your shock. So it's kind of like doing an oil change on your car. You can ignore it as long as you want, but you don't get to get a free engine because you ignored the oil change.
lower leg service is probably the number one thing you can do to keep your fork feeling awesome. You were talking about the service intervals having to be applied globally. So yep. thinking about Pacific Northwest and the fact that we've got dry parts of the Pacific Northwest and wet parts, you know, if somebody is say, you know, they're in BC, like do, do they need to uh, pay attention more or less or differently than somebody that's in Eastern Oregon? Um, you know, I think it's similar for different reasons. Mud, mud is super aggressive. Mud gets everywhere and it just, you know, it sticks. But then also, so does dust. It, it does kind of different things, but it does the same thing just without the water, if you will. Um, I, I think that's also why it's good to, especially if you're a DIY person, if you're willing to like watch the videos or read the manuals and get the stuff yourself, it's so easy to do basic air can service and lower leg seal service. Um, at the very least, just to check. Talk to me about just general cleaning of suspension parts while they're still on the bike. So cleaning your bike. So I hear sometimes people say, you know, don't spray your stanchions. And meanwhile, other people say, you know, get this special cleaner to spray on them after every ride and all that sort of stuff. What's yeah. your philosophy on that? So I'm, <laughs> I'm a pretty lazy mechanic myself, but I, I have developed techniques that make it very efficient to be lazy. I, I it's kind of like the cobbler's kids gets no shoes. Like my bike just, gets dirty and I just put it in the corner, but also I get to fully rebuild it whenever I want. If I ever have time, um, generally speaking, I think you don't want to, if you're going to wash your bike, don't use high pressure water that, you know, water always wins. It will always find its way into places. Um, the, the lip wiper seals on your forks and your shocks are designed to push mud away and push water away and keep, you know, sitting water from getting in, but they're not designed to, to do anything against high pressure water. Um, I, I kind of, I prefer letting my bike dry other than the chain cause the chain can start to rust, but like I'll let my bike dry and then I'll brush everything off. Um, just use like a clean cloth and wipe everything away from the seals. Um, some people really like using the stanchion spray or like the drip lube. I, I personally don't like that stuff, but I also do service. So to me, it's like, why would you push anything down into the fork when you could, remove the lowers and do the job properly. But also some people aren't going to do that work or they aren't going to pay somebody to do that work. So if you want your stuff to feel really good, then yeah, you can drip some lube around the seals um, just to kind of free them up. A a another version of that trick, assuming you have bath oil in the fork lowers is you can flip the whole bike upside down, let it sit for five minutes. All the oil that's at the bottom of your fork legs will now be down at the foam rings and just give it a squish and then boom, you've kind of effectively re-lubed that area without pushing stuff down in. So you mentioned not spraying it with high pressure. Um, I've heard that before. I also, I use a garden hose and I'll put it yeah. on the, the, the higher pressure garden hose setting yeah, and I haven't fine. had any problems, that's fine. But yeah. that's not like a pressure washer, right? Some people might actually take a pressure washer to their bike and that's probably not the greatest idea. Yeah, they, people, they do that Whistler at the bottom of the runs on the muddy days, oh. just <laughs> blast them, you know, but you're on vacation. You want your bike clean. That's fine. I get it. Um, but yeah, a, a garden hose, I mean, uh, on the rare times where it's super, super muddy, uh, and I want to make sure that I don't have a bunch of mud and dirt dripping in my garage, then yeah, I'll use a garden hose and just kind of hose everything down. Um, I don't go nuts. Cause again, like I said, with my bike, I'm lazy. I just get all the big stuff off and leave the chain and go ride again. What other words of wisdom do you have for bicycle suspensions? I think that the, the biggest things are, we've already talked about this, but um, staying up on the maintenance, that's, that's crucial. Um, but also I think setup is as crucial. I mean, I mentioned this before, you can have the fanciest fork in the world and if you don't set it up right, you're not going to get out of it what you paid for. Um, it's kind of like when, you know, I'll have people bring in stuff and they're like a 140 pound rider and they have, you know, more air pressure than I would have in my fork. Like I'll do a little fork test. I'm like, there's no way they're getting full travel out of this thing. And there, you know, there's kind of a myth that, Oh, I don't want to bottom out. I'm like, no, no, no. It's, it's okay to bottom out. You, you paid for 150 millimeters of travel every once in a while. You should get full travel. Um, same thing with rebound. That's the number one thing I see is everybody has their rebound too slow. And I think that's because in the parking lot, if you turn the rebound enough to where you can feel it in the parking lot, then your head is like, Oh, my rebound is working. 
And technically you're correct, it is working, but now it's so slow that it's not the right setting for trail use. So I, I think setup is, is crucial. And, it, and again, it's another one of those things where if I help somebody with their setup, I get the sag set right, get the rebound set right, they come back, they're like, it's like a, a totally different bike, a totally different fork. And yeah, it, it literally is a totally different fork because now it's set up properly. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for letting me bounce all these questions off of you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for setting it up. All right, man. Take care, and uh, you'll be seeing my fork soon. <laughs> Sounds good.